Now for the secret history of a major challenge to British military authority. Just after World War II, the RAF sent a 25-year-old wireless operator to prison for 10 years for mutiny. Oh. Young Norris Symbolist was accused of being one of the instigators of the biggest single act of mass defiance in the history of Britain's armed forces. This is the story of that mutiny, of how it shook the establishment and of how it exposed bitter divisions between officers and men. This was once RAF Jodhpur, a remote air base in northern India. Two months after VJ Day, something unprecedented happened here. 2,000 airmen went on strike. The commanding officer, he went down to take the parade. There was no one turned up at all. He wondered whether it was Sunday, and he realized there was a mutiny on. He then called in the Indian troops who came in with armoured cars and uh, guns at the ready. It was a very tense moment. The strike ended peacefully after four days. But it had demonstrated the men's deep resentment, particularly over living conditions. Conditions were excellent. We lived in the Maharaja's old palace, uh, which contained a swimming pool, tennis courts, squash courts. Every two officers had a bearer, which was a servant, uh, to lay out his clothes in the evening, to run his bath for him, give him the call in the morning with a cup of tea, um, life was very luxurious. By contrast, there were no luxuries for the lower ranks. Many ordinary airmen lived as though they were still at war. The food was murder. The Khansa army we used to, used to supply was obviously a crook because the meat that was put on the table was, was old buffalo meat. And I'm talking about a top station. One day it would be, it would be rissoles. I ain't never seen anything like them. We used to call them assholes. I played poker regularly with four other people. And uh, the procedure was that we would buy ourselves a, a bottle of gin or a bottle of whiskey from dinner onwards. Uh, we would play cards, we would drink our drink and by one or two o'clock in the morning, we went to bed very tight and very happy. In searing temperatures, with water often rationed, some men died from heat exhaustion. It was very hot there, 120 in the shade, and uh, you couldn't work in the afternoon, so you got up early. About, I think we got up about six o'clock, I think. It's early for me. And uh, you worked in the morning, and then you just laid on the bed uh, with the mosquito nets around you for the rest of the day. And you're hot and you can't sleep. And you're sweating, pouring. Now this causes the pores, especially across the back, to exhaust and they become inflamed. Then they become infected, especially if you scratch them. Once they're infected, you're in terrible trouble. 
In India, every one of our 120,000 airmen could expect to be in hospital with an infectious disease at least once a year, sometimes more. BOAC, the new state airline, was seen by Whitehall as a useful tool for binding the post-war empire together. On some of the larger bases, airmen were used as cheap labor to service BOAC aircraft. There were units that were uh, complaining they were servicing BOAC airline, airlines on staging posts across India, which they hadn't been conscripted to do, being conscripted to fight against fascism, not to um, help uh, service commercial organizations. While officers ordered this work to be done, the men simply wanted to get home. The first strike at Jodhpur had lasted only four days, but it was enough to alarm the authorities. And it sent signals from the Middle East down to Singapore. At more than 60 airbases, a series of strikes broke out involving over 50,000 ordinary airmen, mechanics, fitters and electricians. With the end of the war, many airmen found that they had little to celebrate. The new Labour government had been helped into power by the votes of millions of servicemen and women who expected Labour to bring them home quickly. Demobilising five million people was a massive task. For three years, Whitehall had been drawing up plans to do it smoothly. Anyway, it's goodbye to Air Force Blue at last. Sometimes it seemed that this day would never come. In the first year of peace, the army would be cut by 62%, the navy by 50%, but the RAF by only 42%. Only 140,000 airmen were to be demobbed for the first six months of 1946, a slower pace than the other services. It was a recipe for dissent. We were the forgotten army. The war was over and they were getting on with Civvy Street in England and uh, we were stuck out there and nothing was happening. At the end of the war, the RAF had over a million men and women in uniform. It had 1,600 bases stretching from Europe to the Far East. Some were in exotic locations but these no longer held any attraction for the men. The more they kept me there, away from my wife at home, newly wed, I had a deep, fired anger within me, and everybody else did. In Southeast Asia, the plan to repatriate airmen was called Operation Python. It was soon behind schedule. We had very little shipping to spare, having lost enormous numbers in the Battle of the Atlantic. We had no long, very few long-range aircraft, transport aircraft, and it was not possible to carry out Python up to time. The end of the European war, thousands of men, including myself, were posted out to the Far East to carry on the war against Japan. And these men felt that they had done their bit and won the war in Europe. And they felt, going out to the Far East, that all their chums staying at home were going to get the best jobs in civil life. And they were very upset about it. Many airmen were angry over what they saw as official incompetence. And rumors began to spread. And they said, well, we're supposed to be repatriated, but there's no space on the boats going back. And the sailors said, well, that's a load of nonsense because we're actually on the boats that are coming back and forth and they're going back to England empty. Of course, that lit the blue touch paper, didn't it? 
RAF Drig Road, a large airbase near Karachi. Here, events were about to take a dramatic turn. After dark, nearly a thousand disgruntled airmen gathered on the camp football pitch. There was anger in the night air. Every Saturday, the men at Drig Road paraded in the fierce Indian sun. They were ordered for the first time to turn out in their heavy woolen best blue uniforms. They refused to obey. News of the parade ground protest was soon on the wires. As the message spread, other bases followed suit. Just two days later, three bases in Ceylon came out. And that's how it used to come through, and the moment the news comes through, it spread like wildfire through the camp. Then, two bases in the Middle East went on strike, and the strikers had taken the keys to the station signal room. This is the, the radio room, and they were using the equipment to uh, influence other stations. Back at Drig Road, 1,200 airmen had signed a petition. Bypassing their officers, they sent it directly to Prime Minister Clement Attlee. They told him they were not satisfied with the slow demob rate, nor with British foreign policy. Why cannot demobilisation be speeded up? Is it because British foreign policy in India and Indonesia require larger forces? If so, we demand a reversal of this policy. Attlee must have known that the men were right. Since the end of the war, British troops have been fighting nationalist and communist groups in Indonesia and the Dutch East Indies, and in Vietnam we'd thrown Ho Chi Minh out of Saigon. Britain could not afford a large army, but the empire had to be policed. Recently released documents show that as far back as October 1945, the government had come up with what it thought was a discreet solution. John Strachey, Under Secretary of State, wrote to the Chief of the Air Staff. A relatively large RAF and a small army is by far the most economical way of meeting our world commitments. But nobody told the airmen. Resentment was inevitable. What do they do when an airman stands up and says, I don't want to be used to uh, implement government foreign policy on these peoples or those peoples uh, in Indonesia or in India itself or in Malaya or in Burma. I mean, well, what does a commanding officer do to this? I mean, as I said, he could, um, he could deal with a complaint about the food or about the uh, leave. He couldn't deal with this. It was outside his ken. Well, the uh, authorities uh, immediately said that it was a mutiny. They, they said that according to the Air Force regulations and the Air Force Act, uh, it doesn't uh, permit you to go on strike in the Air Force, and if you do anything of that kind, it's a mutiny against authority. Doug Denny and his fellow airmen at their base at Chikari, northern India, had a CO who had no doubts about whether the action was a strike or a mutiny. This officer said, you have refused duty. I am empowered by the King's regulations to tell you that if you do not report for duty, I will select ten men and I will execute, shoot, one of that ten. If, I, if, if then the remainder of the ten refuse duty, I will shoot the ten. And he said, I'll keep going and select another 10 and do the same. If it continues on and on and on, he'll keep selecting 10 and kill one of the 10 and then the 10. I'll shoot them. That's all. Everybody went back to their billets and the next, next thing was back to work tomorrow. 
Well, there's no answer to that, is there? There's no answer to that. On some basis, though, other airmen decided that there was an answer to this sort of threat. We decided that um, if there was going to be any military action taken against us, we weren't going to be defenceless. So we decided to um, make sure that the keys of the armory were kept safely in the hands of a member of the strike committee. After fighting for their country for five years, airmen at bases in the Middle East, India and Southeast Asia were now preparing for a new and much greater wave of strikes. They continued to meet, but they made sure that it was after dark, so there was less chance of them being identified. It had been arranged for the, um, the airmen to meet in the camp canteen that night. And um, they were sitting around drinking, talking and he suddenly the lights went out and someone got up no one knew who onto a table uh, with a pencil in their mouth to disguise their voice and outlined the plan for the strike to commence the following day Bernard Schilling was based at Alabad northeast India his experiences were to be repeated at camps as far away as Singapore it was touch and go that morning because those on the strike committee were standing waiting outside this RAF hangar could only see this bare expanse of parade ground and absolute silence everywhere until in a distance you could hear the sound of marching feet and from all sides of the camp 2,000 airmen under control of corporals came marching smartly in the direction of the parade ground and as they reached the parade ground, they veered sharply left and right and made their way into the cinema, which is a converted RAF hangar. Bernard Schilling, just 19 years old, was elected by the men to make a statement to senior officers. We do not wish to have our demobilization delayed while we are used out here for reasons of imperialist foreign policy. Over the next three days, nine more bases went on strike. It seemed as if the situation was spiraling out of control. These unique photographs, which show an actual strike meeting in progress, were banned and confiscated by the authorities at the time. Sometimes the names of bases on strike were painted on the side of aircraft flying the transport routes. Next, the startling news that Cawnpaw in central India had come out. Cawnpaw was the biggest place of all. Thousands of men there. Because it was the largest MU, maintenance unit, in the empire. As more and more bases came out, senior officers were losing patience. Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Park, in charge of the RAF in Southeast Asia, sent a signal to London. What assistance may I call on the army to give in the event of men refusing persistently to return to work when ordered by their officers? London replied the same day. You can, of course, call on the army to give whatever assistance you may consider practical and necessary. Later that day, a crucial event took place. A thousand men of the Royal Indian Air Force came out, making the same demands as their British counterparts. British troops, these are infantrymen of the Yorks and Lancs driving Stuart tanks in a Muslim area, are regarded as a reassuring asset in this tense situation. In 1946, India was demanding independence. The British were terrified by the spread of disaffection to the Indian airmen. With rebellion in the air, 
They needed loyal Nothing troops. Weren't available hardly bears contemplation. You have to remember that no decision had yet been taken to give India independence. Uh, that came later, so it came some months later. Therefore, India was not quietly waiting for independence, and there was a possibility that India would rebel and would actually fight for independence. And in that case, God knows what would happen, all hell would break loose. On February the 18th, all hell did break loose. To the horror of the British, 1,200 ratings of the Royal Indian Navy mutinied in Bombay Harbour. It was as if they'd taken their cue from the RAF airmen. In Bombay, thousands had taken to the streets in support of the mutineers. In the rioting that followed, Mervyn Jones witnessed the killing of Indian civilians by British troops. I was standing in a main road and uh, very suddenly a British Army truck came round the corner, driving quite fast, with two machine guns mounted on it, open truck, two machine guns, and opened fire into the crowd. And everybody hit the deck, including me. Uh, I was probably nearer to being killed than I ever was in the war. Uh, and when one looked round, uh, you know, there were people with stretchers taking away the wounded, and a uh, number of people had been killed and wounded on that occasion. And then I learnt uh, making inquiries that this was not an isolated incident. RAF bombers flew over the Indian mutineers, threatening to sink their ships, a tactic which angered many airmen. The use of RAF bombers to intimidate and uh, repress Indian naval mutineers was something that we didn't really want to happen. We didn't feel it should have happened. Um, and it's precisely one of the reasons why we had articulated the demand that British troops should not be used to impose colonialist re regimes any longer. And we weren't going to be used for that purpose. An alarmed Air Chief Marshal Park signalled London. I, I do not believe that the airmen who, who took part in the recent so-called strikes appreciate that their, their action may be endangering the safety of India. Then the strike spread to Singapore. 4,000 men at Selatar came out in the biggest strike so far. These are photographs of the strike meeting. Air Chief Marshal Park had come to confront the men. But many of them walked out, claiming that he'd not been straight with them. On the evening of the 27th, the disturbances spread to RAF Kalang, close to the town of Singapore. Six members of the strike committee were surprised by a group of officers and arrested for incitement to mutiny. An hour later, an angry confrontation was taking place between officers and men who were demanding their release. Norris Symbolist, who'd been voted chairman of the strike committee, jumped up on the back of a lorry with officers to address the men. At least the RAF called Symbolist became even more outspoken and before long he was arrested. Symbolist, a young airman from a Jewish family in the East End of London, was not a conscript. He'd volunteered to join the RAF to fight fascism. Norris Symbolist was one of four airmen to be arrested and charged with mutiny. The others were Jimmy Stone, Mick Noble and Arthur Atwood. Of the four, only Arthur Atwood is still alive. He returned to India to tell his remarkable story. Atwood was a trade unionist and chairman of the Drig Road Strike Committee, a high-risk occupation. 
But what do you do in that situation? If everybody decided to go and hide, that would have been tantamount to betraying the men on that site. Betraying the men who had decided then, you know, that it's time to try and give vent to their feelings. Now, if you all run away from the problem, uh, apart from people like myself feeling that we were cowards, you would be helping those who wanted to keep us out there indefinitely and use for what we consider were thoroughly uh, wrong purposes. While Arthur Atwood and the others were angry at being kept abroad in bad conditions, the difference now was that with a Labour government in power, they felt able to speak out. EVT, Educational and Vocational Training. Ironically, the RAF encouraged men like Atwood to discuss politics through its own training unit known as EVT. Now, now I want to come on to the second part of the discussion. And By the end of the war, vigorous questioning and debate were commonplace in all the forces. Do in return for what we expect from the government. What's the first duty of the citizen, do you think? Well, the first duty, sir, is uh, to, for a citizen to use his vote. At one large RAF camp which I was at, uh, they even, the education people even uh, invited the Russian ambassador to Britain to come down to speak to a large meeting and talk to us about the Russian involvement in the war and so on. So this is how far things were going, organised organized quite officially by the educational side uh, in the Royal Air Force. At the end of the war, Atwood had joined a group of communist airmen who'd started to meet at a house in Karachi. After the unrest came to a head at Drig Road, Atwood's camp, the communists met to decide how to respond. John Saville was chairman of the group. There was no way that the discontent was going to be uh, uh, in any way dampened down or stopped. What was necessary was that the discontent should in fact be organised in ways which would bring results. And that, I think, was the purpose uh, of the small communist group. The authorities, on the other hand, saw the purpose as much more politically sinister. They were organised by this uh, small party of, of hotheads and political uh, activists that you get in any community and naturally amongst these uh, basically civilian airmen there were quite a number. And uh, there's no doubt about it, barrack room lawyers we call them and they um, certainly organised things and led things, and uh, quite a number of them were, were caught. Since the four airmen charged with mutiny were members of the Communist Party, this seemed to confirm official fears. We wanted to try and ensure to the extent that we had any influence that it took the correct direction as we perceived it. Um, and this we did. No more or no less than that. And since as an individual I'd already got involved, I accepted the responsibility as far as I could, holding that meeting, to play my part collectively, both with party and non-party people, with Labour Party people, with all kinds of other people. Um, and we demonstrated that in the weeks ahead. And so did something like 50 thousand other airmen, not just me. Well, of course, they would think this was communist-led or communist-inspired or Moscow-inspired, because that's the way the official mind thought at the time. They couldn't possibly conceive this was a spontaneous protest by ordinary British airmen. Spontaneous or not, 
The RAF had decided that the communists were indeed the culprits, and by the beginning of March, the crackdown on the strikers had begun. The RAF sent in its own investigating officers. Known as the SIB, or Special Investigation Branch, they interrogated thousands of airmen. They soon established a reputation for underhand methods. The SIB said they were under instructions from the Foreign Office. When they arrived in Karachi, they soon focused on Arthur Atwood. They indicated there was a chair, so I sat down. The flight lieutenant asked me if um, I was one of those. LAC Atwood, he said, <coughs> were you one of those who attended uh, the meeting that took place in the dark on the football field on the 17th of January? One of those. I didn't answer the direct question, but said, I can recall attending a subsequent parade of the commanding officer when it was clearly understood by myself that uh, the whole incidents to which you refer had been forgiven and that there would be no victimization. I therefore pointed out uh, to the uh, flight lieutenant that under these circumstances I was not prepared to make any kind of statement and then shut up. Because Atwood was so popular with the other airmen, the SIB treated him with caution. At RAF Kampur in northern India, Jimmy Stone, one of the strike organizers, came under investigation by the SIB. He was told frequently that um, he needn't be concerned about his wife and, and child, which was me, at home because of, of the close proximity that my mother lived to Russell Square and I believe that that Canadians and an American um, Americans were stationed in in Russell Square and the they were told they told my father that my mother was being well entertained and well cared for by by Canadians and that he needn't worry about our welfare. Atwood was told that he was to be repatriated and was ordered to Bombay, a journey across India that would take a week. In the heat of Bombay, he spent days in a transit camp, straining to hear names being called out from long lists, the names of men picked to go home. His name was never called. After two weeks, he was told the truth. I was told for the first time that I could forget about the boat lists uh, because uh, I would not be going home. Two days later, while he was sleeping in his barracks, two armed RAF MPs arrested Atwood. They turned out his kit bag and took his address book, which he never saw again. Atwood was taken to Kalyan, a huge barracks 50 miles from Bombay, and held in solitary confinement. He was later charged with incitement to mutiny. As the SIB continued its investigations, the promises of no victimization turned to dust. He said, if you agree to go back to work uh, tomorrow, I will make it my business to put your uh, complaints to the authorities in Lo the Air Force authorities in London. I will also guarantee there'll be no victimization. The two strike leaders at Cornpore, Jimmy Stone and Mick Noble, were about to receive the same treatment as Atwood. When they too were sent to Bombay, they thought they were about to be shipped home for Demar. They didn't quite make it. He was actually arrested as he was going up the gangplank of the boat that was to take him home. It seemed 
like a particular emotional cruelty to, to wait until you were actually on the gangplank to go home and then arrest you. Stone and Noble were imprisoned in rat-infested cells next to Atwood at Kalyan. Here, they would learn the harsh techniques of the SIB. A lot of the difficulty was surrounding this sort of emotional um, assault and that he would be woken up in the night and taken to a different place and questioned and left to go to sleep for a while and woken up and put into the truck and moved to another place and this would go on for most parts of the night. I guess they were wanting him to say that he was trying to get the people to be involved in a full-scale mutiny. But he wouldn't have been able to say that because he wasn't. In Singapore, young Norris Symbolist was to discover that the whole might of the military establishment was out to crush him. Norris Symbolist was about to become the defendant in a show trial. Sir Keith Park had been ordered to ensure the sentence should be given the widest publicity. In a top secret message, Sir Keith ordered, ringleaders are to be dealt with most severely and not to be shown any leniency by unit commanders or court martial. In solitary, Norris Symbolist wrote home to his father. Dear Daddy, thank M for the papers. Only one correction. I wasn't waiting very long for the court-martial. In fact, it was pushed through as quickly as possible. No doubt the reason was to prevent me getting in touch with those who might have helped. I was arrested in secret when I and everyone else thought I'd be on a boat bound for home. For over 50 years, the transcripts of Symbolist Court Martial have been restricted. Now they've been released, and we know what happened. The president of the Court Martial was Group Captain Gerald Marvin. Why was I picked? Well, you have to ask my senior officers that one, but uh, I only come to one conclusion. The fact that I was a fairly experienced Court Martial president, I'd done 250. Uh, when I was convalescent with my broken leg in 1940 and uh, uh, did a standing court-martial board for six months. So I had a good knowledge of the uh, court-martial procedures. And also I was the one station I knew who hadn't had any trouble. Group Captain Marvin, like his fellow officers in the court-martial, had no formal legal training. He was told not to make a muck of it. It's going to be a rather tricky case and that uh, we're going to say, don't uh, mess up the court martial. By, we meant by that by technicalities, which so often can happen, uh, procedures. Symbolist was facing two charges one, inciting airmen to mutiny, and two, using insubordinate language to a senior officer. First met him when he marched into court, and uh, I watched him. He made self assured, is my impression. He's a little bit cocky. Symbolist didn't think much of the men trying him either. He wrote home... My infamous court-martial. I'm sure a more bigoted set of reactionaries were never in one room in the interests of injustice than that crew. Much of what happened is not recorded, but it is still apparent that not one word given in my defence was accepted. As the trial progressed, the transcripts revealed the case against Symbolist was by no means clear. The prosecution and defence agreed that Symbolist had used the words. These gentlemen, at least the Air Force call them gentlemen. The question was, did you do this, say this to the officer? Yes or no? And so he said yes. But I had to keep on saying that. But the defence witnesses said that Symbolist had used the words only after an officer had used obscene language, had sarcastically referred to the men as gentlemen, and had called Symbolist a Hyde Park soapbox orator. The prosecution portrayed Symbolist as a ringleader and an agitator, out to provoke a strike in support of the striking airmen at Salatar and the five arrested committeemen. They claimed he shouted, We want those five men out! 
I'm calling on you, if you're still with me, come out on strike until they're released. It's up to us to support our comrades at Selitar. Nine defence witnesses, including one officer, argued that Symbolist was not the ringleader, but a spokesman fairly representing the airman's views. They said he shouted, Are you in favour of going on strike until the men are released? The majority of the men answered by raising their arms. Symbolist tried to call Sir Keith Park as a defence witness. He wanted to prove that his views were no different from tens of thousands of other strikers. No action had been taken against them. Park did not appear. Instead, he left to inspect troops in Ceylon. The trial lasted a week before Symbolist was found guilty. Now they had to agree on a sentence. On a slip of paper, starting with the most junior officer, each man wrote down how long the punishment should be. As president of the trial, Group Captain Marvin had the final say, but he had to reach a figure that was agreed by all the other officers, although he wasn't happy. Well, my opinion, no, I, I gave a high one. I'd like to do that now. <laughs> So I couldn't at the time. Mine was higher. Uh, uh, I noticed the low ones were, uh, were sort of inexperienced officers, junior, juniors, I thought. They were. And we gradually came to the, obviously, the sensible one, was 10 years being served to. Uh, how, how long would you have been happy with? Uh, well, I'm not supposed to, well, I can now, I suppose it's now being confirmed. I, mine was 15 years. The ten-year sentence was a clear warning to any more airmen thinking of striking. Norris Symbolist was stripped of his wings, dishonourably discharged from the RAF, and sent back to England to start his sentence. To be stripped of his wings, that was more painful for him than a lot of what happened in the rest of, of that situation. Um, I mean, he, he was so proud to have had his wings. And he wasn't a conscript. He, he volunteered for, to go into the RAF. Those wings were, were so precious to him. But it was as if he lost something that was very dear to him when he lost his wings. The trial of Arthur Atwood was held in this large colonial house used as an officer's residence in the suburbs of Bombay. He was defended by a firm of local solicitors, Muller and Muller, who had only four days to prepare his case and find witnesses. So there were about 15 witnesses there, but they were all witnesses for the prosecution. So you didn't have any witnesses? We had no witnesses, no. Isn't that a rather odd situation? Yeah, well, that is typical of the whole treatment of the case, wasn't it, you know? In fact, Muller and Muller won the case because Atwood's CO had promised no victimisation. Atwood was released, but the victory was short-lived. The RAF simply refused to accept the verdict. Atwood was re-arrested and imprisoned at Warley Camp near Bombay. Three days after his arrest, Atwood was back in court. The RAF had performed a shameful U-turn. It was clear that they'd been instructed that A, they got to reconvene the court, and B, they got to find the right verdict, which was a verdict of guilty. Right? Um, notwithstanding the evidence, notwithstanding condemnation and so on. Atwood was found guilty and returned to prison to await confirmation of his sentence. The strain was beginning to affect his health. I was laying on this bed, you know, it's a, a rude board uh, bed, like, uh, breathing very rapidly, and I couldn't stop myself breathing. You know, my, my chest was heaving up and down. I suppose that's that's one way that uh, some nervous breakdowns occur. 
had a tendency towards crying, you know, these kind of things. Back home, an Atwood defence campaign supported by the trade unions was already underway. The pressure was building for a review of the mutiny charges. You must, I think, appreciate that the general feeling and sentiment in the country was such that it expected that the Labour government would act quite differently from uh, previous uh, Conservative governments. Uh, and this was only 1946, remember, less than a year after the election and the ordinary people of the country and the trade unionists in particular, who after all were very numerous in those days and strong politically speaking, did expect a Labour government to act quite differently from the way in which a Conservative administration uh, would, have, uh, would have operated. In Bombay, Atwood was transferred to a military hospital to undergo psychiatric care, although he was still watched by armed guards. While Atwood was convalescing in hospital, there was an astounding announcement on the radio. It was revealed this morning that the charges against LAC Atwood have been dropped. He could hardly believe his ears. He thought it was another SIB ploy. To my surprise, within one or two days, the door opened and two of my colleagues came in to see me. It happened to be two um, people that were in residence in the uh, next cells to me at Worley and was none other than Jimmy Stone. McNabb. Is that an amazing moment to see them? Yes. The old emotion got, got at me again. There is no question that without a defence committee of the kind that we uh, were able to put together uh, in London, there is no question that Arthur would in fact have gone the same way as Symbolist. That is to say, he would have been sentenced, as Symbolist was, to a long, long number of years of imprisonment. On the 27th of June, the charges against Stone and Noble were dropped. The campaign had worked. The implications of this victory were even more profound. A shaken establishment realized that men who joined for one cause could not be manipulated to fight another. Oh yes, undoubtedly it was a success in that respect, yes. Because it showed that uh, the, the conscripted armed forces couldn't be counted upon to uh, do what was necessary to hold the old British Empire together. I'll use the word, never had a mutiny or um, a sort of uh, action against authority like this before or since. I mean, it was something unknown, unheard of in the Air Force, and therefore it was a humiliation. They were shitting themselves, which, to our delight, <laughs> brought about the end product, which was got us home. When Arthur Atwood returned to England, he immediately joined the campaign for the release of Norris Symbolist. As a result of the pressure around Norris Symbolist, his sentence was uh, reduced to five years, but that was not satisfactory. And after a long uh, struggle, especially by the National Council of Stabilities um, and by the unions and by many an individual, Norris Symbolist only, I say advisedly, only served 22 months. In fact, he served a third of his vicious sentence and it's the credit of Norris Symbolist and of the movement 
that uh, we eventually played a part in his release. In November 1947, Norris Simlis was released from prison. The RAF, unnerved by the unrest, demobbed an extra 100,000 men in the early part of 1946. By the end of 1947, most of the RAF's civilians in uniform had gone home. Yeah.